here soon. I'm seeing the show today. It's uh, my pleasure to, uh, to introduce the next session, starting with uh, the moderator, John Coleman. John Coleman is a member of our RMP Steering Committee. He is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Bay Planning Coalition and serves as the Dredging Committee Rep on the Steering Committee. John is uh, holds is engaged in a lot, lot of 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 uh, advisory boards, et cetera, in the region. Note, note where they, he is on the board of directors for East Bay Mud, and uh, and brings a lot of uh, manage, management insight to our discussions at the RNP. I, I also am pleased to note that. John, as well, has, uh, is a graduate from Cal Berkeley, so we, we do have a number of us Cal Bears engaged today. So, John, uh, go ahead, take over, the, take over the session. Great, Tom. Thank you very much, and I'm very honored to be asked to moderate the sec session on sediment monitoring and management. Uh, what people need to understand is sediment is at one time was considered non-value, uh, I think, to many people in the United States. Today, sediment is critical to the, that has a critical value not only to shoreline resiliency and wetland development, but just the general health of any bay and water area. So what we need to do is make sure that the sediment is used for uh, as, as much as can restoration, but at the same time, we need to be cognizant that it is expensive to remove and the process, but we're moving in the right direction. I think working with SFEI and the Regional Water Board and other agencies to make sure that we are going to use the sediment to the best of our ability here in the San Francisco Bay, and that will allow for more uses down the road. And what I'd like to do is we have three fantastic speakers today. They're all experts in their own right. They're each going to have 20 minutes of a presentation. I do not want to take too much time away from their presentations. But our first lead off is Maggie Dutch, who is the lead scientist at Washington State Department of Ecology Marine Sediment Monitoring Team. And she has been uh, with this team since 1992 and studying sediments and benthos in the Puget Sound Sediment Monitoring Program. She is uh, also a science advisor to RMP Status and Trends Program Review. And rather than taking any more time, your bio, you can find it about Maggie. I'd like to hand it off to Maggie right now. Great, thank you. I can't seem to start my video. It says the host has stopped it. Okay. There, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. And tell me when you're ready, when you can see it. All right, is that working? That's great, Maggie. Great, okay, great. Well, good morning. Um, I'm really glad to be here, and I would really like to thank Melissa for inviting me to tell you about our Puget Sound Sediment Monitoring Program. I feel like we're a sister program to the San Francisco monitoring work, and we've been through much of the same processes of revision and evolution of our program that you have been and are currently going through now with yours. So first I'd like to acknowledge my team members um, and I put all of our contact information on here. So you are welcome to call us, any of us at any time with questions about our work. So as an overview, first I'm going to tell you about our Puget Sound study area um, and then a little bit of the history of our monitoring program, give you kind of an evolution at a glance for some of the changes that we've made over 32 years, um, what we've learned from our data and all of our work and where we're headed with our most current uh, remodel and redesign. So our study area is the breadth of Puget Sound. Um, it is a complex estuarine system in Western Washington, and it is considered the southernmost waters of the Salish Sea, which extends up um, into British Columbia. 
It is really big with a surface area over 2,000 square kilometers, and it extends roughly 200 miles from Olympia to the Canadian border. It is really complex. Um, it's a glacially fjord, glacially created fjordal estuary with five distinct basins, and they include shallow bays, uh, very deep waters up to about 300 meters, broad channels, river deltas, and each has unique and distinct water masses. It has a great diversity of habitats, both in the pelagic and the benthic zones. Um, the Pacific Ocean waters enter at depth through Admiralty Inlet, and the fresh water um, enters in the surface layers from the many large rivers um, that are glacially fed from the, the mountains and the Cascades. Um, the sediment habitat is uh, generally uh, fine-grained, but there is also a range of gravel sand, um, especially in the nearshore area, and silt and clay throughout. So we've got lots of people, although I'm, I feel humbled when uh, I saw the numbers for Chesapeake Bay, um, but our 4 million plus people do uh, have a lot of activity that create pressures on the ecosystem. Um, we primarily look at toxics in our program, but it's changing. Um, we are now uh, trying to look um, also at the impacts of carbon and nutrient loading and climate change on our ecosystem. So to tell you a little bit about our monitoring program, it was established in 1988 as part of a legislatively mandated Puget Sound ambient monitoring program. It also evolved and changed names. It's now called the Ecosystem Monitoring Program. Um, and it's a really large scale program, uh, multifaceted um, for many of the ecosystem components, um, including uh, the sediments, water column, uh, fish, both toxics um, in fish and other biota, and fish census, fish census um, information, birds, nearshore habitat, and so forth. Um, and it's conducted by uh, multiple natural resource agencies in the state. The objectives of our program, the sediment component over time, have been status and trends um, to be collected on the sediment quality and the macro invertebrate communities, which we call the benthos. Um, and we, not, we don't just focus on contaminated areas. We really are an ambient program and look Puget Sound wide, um, which most of it is relatively uncontaminated. We were originally focused um, for this program on the sediment quality triad of parameters. <clears throat> and that includes looking at the chem a chemical list, of priority pollutants, um, several different lab bioassays, uh, and the influence of both of those on the benthic communities. Okay, so now um, I want to try to give you um, an overview of the evolution of our program. And to put together this presentation, I needed to really think about all the changes we've made over three decades. So I put together a table that summarized these changes. And then I realized that it was like one of those tables that you really shouldn't show in a presentation. But I am, and that's for the benefit of the SFEI folks who are going to be um, working on the sediment program revision. But for everybody else, don't try to read this. I just want to um, review, give you kind of the highlights of it. So like SFEI, we've undergone actually three reviews of our program over time at um, seven year and 12 year intervals um, at sort of natural breakpoints. 
And with those revisions, we've reinvented the program several times, and we're currently on our fourth iteration. So to do that, what we've done is make changes to the elements you see as the column headers, our sampling frame, sampling design, number of stations and sampling frequency, and that great long list of parameters that we've had. So all in all, I just really want to get the point across that it's complicated. We've had a lot of things to consider um, and a lot of time to do it. So 32 years um, and going strong. Um, so uh, to begin with, I want to give you an overview of um, what kinds of changes we've made to those different elements of the program. So we started out um, with a monitoring design that had 86 hand-picked stations. I guess you call that a haphazard sampling design. And with those, we could characterize the sediments from each station, but we couldn't say anything about the surrounding area. So that went on for a number of years. Um, and just as we were beginning to feel a little uh, bit of despair uh, because we wanted to know more about the actual sampling areas, not just particular stations, we had two really fantastic opportunities to monitor our sediments as part of two federal estuarine monitoring programs. First, um, Ed Long from NOAA came in and uh, he was the lead for the National Status and Trends Program, looking at estuaries around the country. And he asked us um, to partner with him to survey Puget Sound. Um, so that was our first partnership. Um, and then as that program uh, was winding down, um, EPA came in with the EMAP program and we partnered with Walt Nelson and Tony Olson from the Newport area. Um, and uh, we also worked with um, SFEI and uh, Bruce Thomas was our partner um, because it was a West Coast wide uh, EMAP program. And that program um, is now, uh, it was a precursor to the National Coastal Condition Program that EPA runs today. So these were um, national estuarine programs and what they brought to us was uh, various versions of stratified uh, random sampling, which we adopted um, to uh, incorporate into the new elements of our program. So um, they brought uh, Ed a, a pretty basic random stratified sampling design and Tony Olson, uh, the inventor of the, um, the Gertz um, design that many of you may have heard of, generalized random tessellation stratified sampling. And what we eventually developed with that was uh, a regional monitoring program and an urban base monitoring program. So for the regions, we, uh, we came up with eight regions around the sound that we sampled 40 stations in each, and we sampled one per year on a seven to 10 year rotating cycle. And we've been able to go uh, two full rounds of that rotational cycle. For the urban bays, it was kind of similar. We picked six of our biggest urban bays that we wanted to characterize, um, 30 to 36 stations per bay, and we'd sample one on a six year rotational cycle, one every year. Um, and we've gone through those on um, three times now. <clears throat> so those um, designs served us well, especially for uh, the chemistry and toxicity um, because uh, on those long, rotational cycles, um, we, it was okay for the chemistry and tox. We were able to see some changes over time. Um, and 
they didn't need, we didn't need to look more frequently at those. But we were feeling a little bit um, queasy about not being able to look at our benthos on um, like an annual cycle or a more frequent cycle. So when we came to the end of the, the, uh, the second rotation of our regions, that was in 2014. And we decided that we really need to rethink our program um, take our lessons learned and uh, move on a bit. So um, what we ended up doing was keeping our urban bays because we really want to keep looking at the chemistry um, at the rate that we were doing and it's really important for the urban bays. But um, we dropped the regional monitoring and uh, came up with a full Puget Sound uh, sampling frame which we are going to sample now every year, 50 stations, um, mainly so we can keep a good track on the benthos and some of the new parameters that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, the chemistry was left um, on a five-year cycle uh, as we um, sample each year. <clears throat> every fifth year, we'll have a full round of chemistry. So those are the changes we've made to the program over time. Um, and now I kind of wanted to give you a brief summary of the lessons that we've learned from our triad data. Um, starting with the chemistry, our data indicated that contaminant levels are pretty low throughout the sound and have remained unchanged for most areas of Puget Sound. When we found high levels, they were in our urban bays and their concentrations, uh, we have seen a decline over three decades. So kind of a good thing. Um, based on the lessons learned from that um, sampling, based on the number of undetected results, we did drop many of the priority pollutant organics that were uh, just generally undetected over time. And um, we have been able to add some new chemicals. Um, the PBDEs um, are something we've added permanently to our list. And some of the other CECs, personal care products and pharmaceuticals and perfluoroalkyl substances, um, we haven't been able to add them permanently because not enough funding. But when I do get some funds available, we've been able to test them in a good number of our stations um, around the sound. So we have learned those lessons from the chemistry for toxicity. Um, what we found that most of our samples were non-toxic, although we did see low level toxicity increase in urban, some of the urban days, which we would have expected, but also in some non-urban areas, which we didn't really expect. So kind of led to the question of there might be other things triggering a toxic response in areas that don't typically have a chemical signal. So for the most part, um, well, the lessons learned there, for the most part, are uh, the tests that we used um, were not highly sensitive in our mostly ambient locations. And we did end up having to change critters um, for some of the tests over time. And now we're a little queasy that like different sensitivities might have confounded some of our trends interpretation. Plus the tests are wickedly expensive and um, we have never really felt like we've gotten really our, the most bang for our buck with them. So we're leaning away from those for the future. Um, for the benthos. Maggie, can you wrap it up pretty quick? Oh yeah. Um, cool, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, for the benthos, um, we have seen major declines in abundance and richness. And um, what we realized is that we needed to measure other ecological functions um, uh, in the future besides just abundance and diversity because um, we have a lot of variation in the many habitat types throughout the sound. So um, overall, there was little correspondence between our 
triad parameters. So we have um, moved on, um, trying to get my slides to change. Um, and sorry, how much time do I have left? I'm sorry, I think I've gone a little about, over. About, about 30 seconds, how's that? <laughs> okay, well, I will try to wrap it up really quickly. Sorry about that. Um, but um, mainly I wanted to make the point that we have moved, uh, we're moving beyond our, our toxic chemicals. And we are now trying to look at other parameters that focus on carbon and nutrient loading and climate change. And we think that um, we are adding, and I'll just skim through these really quickly, um, a large suite of new elements to our benthos um, and mainly a large suite of biogeochemical parameters. Um, and I won't go into these in detail right now, but um, just know that that's kind of the focus of our program. And uh, with those new parameters, um, oh, and we are also um, better corresponding with our water column uh, sampling uh, from our sister program. Um, and we co-located stations with them so we could um, better look at their data as well with our benthos. Um, Great, thank you so much, so, Maggie. We're gonna need to roll yeah. on and then we can hopefully pick up yeah. some of this in the Q&A. How's that? Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no problem, thanks. You have a lot to talk about and we appreciate it. And I should have mentioned your title was Sediment Quality Monitoring in Puget Sound, but you dealt with it very much so. Our next speaker is Dr. Patricia yeah. Weiberg. She's a coastal oceanographer and professor in environmental sciences at the University of Virginia, which she has taught since 1990. And she received her PhD in oceanography from the University of Washington. Uh, we have your bio you have for her and her uh, discussion is going to be sediment transport and coastal resilience. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to Pat and uh, it's yours for the next 20 minutes. Uh, unmute yourself, Pat. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. And you're seeing the slides properly, right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I'm going to take you back to the East Coast and talk about some work that uh, I've been involved with in the coastal base of Virginia, um, a system that has some similarities and some differences compared to San Francisco Bay. So here I've uh, tried to give you a bit of a comparison, um, attempting to put these both at the same scale. So on the left um, is the Del Delmarva Peninsula. Um, to the, on the western side of the Delmarva is Chesapeake Bay, which you heard about earlier. Um, but our uh, focus is uh, on these coastal bays that are on the east side of the Delmarva Peninsula. You can see here just as comparison for size, um, but the overall geography is very different. The Virginia coastal bays are pretty typical barrier bay marsh type system. One unusual thing about this is that almost none of the barrier islands or marshes um, have any um, private land ownership at the moment or um, permanent dwellings. Mostly uh, this part of the system, the uh, eastern part of the Delmarva is owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy or federal and state government. There are this, the, um, the western side of the Delmarva, you can sort of see these agricultural lands. Um, so there are people living here, um, mostly uh, rural and agricultural. There's also uh, fishing activity and aquaculture in the base. So to orient you to this system and uh, help put it uh, in context, say, with what you're more familiar with. Um, 
the the system the of bays uh, is defined by a set of barrier islands um, with tidal inlets. The bays themselves uh, are mostly quite shallow, only about a meter deep on the tidal flats. The tides in this area are about 1.2 meters in tidal range, so that qualifies as microtidal, but the tides are important in this system. If you look up at the top here in terms of population, I know you've been talking about millions of people, um, but here we're talking about um, thousands. So there are two counties uh, that comprise the Virginia part of the Delmarva, and their total population is only on the order of about 60,000 people. Water quality uh, in these bays is extremely good. Um, here's a comparison showing nitrogen loading and a, a variety of different kinds of uh, shallow coastal bays and estuaries. We're way up here. Um, there's very little um, nitrogen loading or other uh, poor water quality indicators in the system. One interesting thing about it is that the, um, there are no significant rivers that bring uh, fresh water or sediment into the system, the main source of sediment for these bays is the ocean and exchange through these tidal inlets. And overall sea level rise in this area is about five millimeters per year. You might wonder why the population is so low, especially on the barrier islands where there are no people at the moment living permanently. Uh, it wasn't always that way. Um, a hundred years ago, uh, there were some uh, permanent communities uh, or semi-permanent communities out on the islands. And the whole region was actually quite prosperous. Um, it had a particularly valuable scout fishery at that time. One of the things that happened, especially with respect to the barrier islands themselves, sorry, is that um, they're dynamic. Uh, these are, sedimentary features. Um, they don't shift uh, north and south very much, but they tend to wobble. And here I'm showing one of the larger islands called Hog Island um, that's shown in this photograph below. It was first settled in the uh, 1600s by English colonists, abandoned. People came back again about a century later. In the late 1800s, um, there were some uh, hunting and fishing clubs catering to um, wealthy sportsmen from out of the area. And uh, communities built up around those. So you're seeing one of the communities on this island. It was in the central part of this island. You can see from this diagram how much uh, the island has shifted in position. Um, that's something that these islands are prone to do particularly in response to things like hurricanes. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, there were several large hurricanes that caused a tremendous amount of beach erosion and flooding. And at that point, the community on the, on the island um, abandoned it, moved many of the buildings to the mainland, and uh, it's never really been inhabited since. As I mentioned, the basis of the economy early in the 1900s was a scout fishery. Um, and associated with the same storms uh, in the 1930s, but also a widespread wasting disease that affected seagrass in the system. Um, well, let me back up. So scallops thrive in seagrass beds. And there were large seagrass beds in these coastal bays. You can see here in the early, uh, from about 1925 to 1930, there was a large increase in the harvest of um, scallops and it brought a lot of wealth to this community. But then in the 1930s, th those hurricanes plus a wasting disease that affected the seagrass caused a major seagrass die off. In fact, all along the East Coast, um, seagrass died off and in the 1930s. Without the seagrass, the scallops didn't survive, and so there's a crash in the scallop fishery. It's never recovered since then. Um, the economy of this region now depends on farming and aquaculture, uh, and it never um, achieved the wealth that it had um, 100 years ago uh, since. 
So with that as a bit of an introduction, um, what I wanted to talk about today is um, are some of the uh, research areas um, that we're working on in this system. Uh, this site is part of a national network of long-term ecological research sites or LTER sites uh, supported by the National Science Foundation. And because seagrass is such an important part of the story here, but also related to sediment, I'm gonna talk a little bit about seagrass restoration uh, briefly about oyster reef restoration and marsh protection. And then in the absence of human impacts on this system because of the low population, um, the, the main stressor on this region is climate change. And uh, in particular, uh, I'll say a little bit about impacts of sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. So, after the seagrass died off in the 1930s, uh, these bays remained seagrass free for almost 70 years. There were some different ideas about why seagrass never reestablished. It did some other places. Um, but in the late 1990s, uh, a patch, a natural patch of seagrass was uh, found in the system and that spurred a large scale um, restoration program led by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, VIMS, which is um, down near Williamsburg in Yorktown in Virginia. Um, that restoration was done by seeding. So they collect seeds from seagrass in the area, including Chesapeake Bay, and in sort of a Johnny Appleseed type manner would disperse the seeds in um, plots uh, throughout the different sites. So, there are several focus sites, one down here, one in this middle region, and one up here. Um, this, the graph on the uh, lower right shows the change in uh, seagrass coverage through time. And you can see here, starting around uh, 2000, the amount of seagrass has risen initially slowly this top line is just the sum of all the seagrass area in these systems, but you can see it really took off after about five years. This is showing the distribution in 2010 after 10 years, and it's continued to rise. So it's about double this um, coverage right now. So two things, one is that it actually has been quite successful. And, and another thing is that there's still quite a bit of area here that has not been um, populated by seagrass. Some of it probably can be, some of it is not suitable habitat. Just as a um, kind of zooming in on this lower bay down here, which is called South Bay, the most uh, successful of the um, meadows that's formed. Sorry. You can see here in this time progression, uh, the little dots are showing where the seeding actually happened through time, just mostly up in this area. And the rest of this between uh, 2006 and 2010 and then 2018 is mostly due to natural spreading of the seagrass after it got established. So it's been doing very well. Um, there's also been uh, an attempt to reintroduce scallops into these bays. Um, that's had somewhat mixed success. Uh, and it's an effort that's still ongoing, although it's unlikely that, um, that the scallop industry will ever be anything like it was in the past, in part just because the whole economics of scallops has changed in the meantime. So the second thing I wanted to talk about uh, are marshes and uh, associated with that uh, some uh, living shoreline type um, installations that we've um, been using. So surrounding all of the base in this system are marshes and uh, we've been looking at the dynamics of these marshes for 30 years. We know that most of the marshes are eroding on their edges so the the marshes themselves are getting smaller the bays are getting larger through time. Some of that loss is compensated by uh, transgression of the marshes into um, inland areas. But if you look at these rates, these are for a set of sites. 
here along the mainland margin of the um, coastal base. You can see the rates are in the range of about a half to a meter per year of marsh shoreline retreat um, through time. And then if you were to look at some of these marshes out here in the bays, uh, rates of marsh edge erosion and those, those marshes can be twice as high. You may be familiar with some of the um, living shoreline type ideas of uh, how to both increase uh, habitat, in this case for oysters, as well as uh, try to minimize uh, or reduce the rates of shoreline erosion. Um, in this system, there are regulations against things like uh, bulkheads, riprap, and other kinds of hard shore shoreline stabilization. So we've been looking at, um, at constructed oyster reefs built near the marsh edge as a way, again, of providing both habitat and some protection to the marsh edges. The ones that we've been using, um, constructing are out of what we call oyster castles. These are, they look a little like uh, cinder blocks, but they're made out of a special concrete that is um, salt resistant. And um, they're stacked up in rows. I'm just gonna show you briefly a bit of a, a video um, showing this in this site. We've actually used four different designs that we're testing for their, both for uh, oyster growth and for wave attenuation. They're narrow and wide, high and low. And we've been monitoring these both for oysters and for waves by putting sensors on either side of the, of the reefs. What we found so far is that uh, the oysters really like the, this substrate. After three years, we've got a tremendous amount of oyster growth. The small low reefs um, really have very little effect on wave energy. This is just showing wave height on the bayward side and landward side. The one-to-one -one line would mean that they're identical, and you can see here that that's essentially true of these small reefs. The larger reefs, by comparison, the waves are smaller on the bay side, on the landward side than they are on the bayward side. So the reefs are having some effect, especially when the water depths are kind of below average water levels. In terms of climate, we've been concerned with two things, uh, sea level rise and, um, and increases in water temperature. Sea level rise in this area is actually relatively high right now. The, the estimate shown here, this is based on 40 years of data from one of the coastal bays. It's about five and a half millimeters per year. One of the things we've been doing in this project for the last uh, several decades has been monitoring marsh elevation change through time using sediment elevation tables or SCTs. And here's a, a time history from uh, 1997 till 2017 of marsh elevation at three sites on one of the mainland marshes. The one at the bottom that I'm showing here is uh, the lowest of the marsh sites. And the rate of increase in elevation is about 4.9 millimeters per year. So comparable to sea level rise. And overall, it does seem that these, the marshes in the system are keeping pace with sea level. Pat, we have about two minutes for your presentation. Perfect. Um, Thank you. Thinking about warming temperatures, uh, we've been able to put together a 35-year record of temperatures in the bays. And what we see is that temperature in the bay is increasing over time significantly. And one of the ramifications of that uh, or associated with higher temperatures are more frequent marine heat waves. So those are periods of time, extended periods of time when water temperatures are, are higher than um, a threshold. And what I'm showing here, just the dots are the incidences of marine heat waves in the bays and the adjacent ocean. Temperatures, peak temperatures that are shown here don't change much through time, but you can see there are many more heat waves in recent years than there had been before. 
sorry, one impact of heat waves is a seagrass to die off. This happened in, in 2015 during a heat wave in South Bay, that large bay with the restored seagrass meadows. The seagrass came back. But one interesting link between seagrass and sediment is that seagrass tends to trap sediment and diebacks may release it. So this is a complicated system, like all of these are. Um, and what we're trying to do now is to build on all of this work to construct a sediment budget that would help us anticipate future change. Um, we're doing this through a combination of observations and models, um, trying to track where sediment goes and, um, and how uh, climate change in particular may affect that. So I'll stop there, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Pat. And uh, very interesting presentation, different dynamics of the Virginia coastline bays versus the San Francisco Bay, which leads us to our next speaker, Xavier Fernandez from the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board Planning Division. And he's responsible for a number of programs, uh, including navigational and judging permitting and establishing water quality standards and policies. He worked on uh, Bear Island and Colon Ranch and Xavier is going to talk today about managing sediment in San Francisco Bay. And after that, we'll go to the Q&A. So I'd like to hand it off to Xavier at this point. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is... Uh, where science uh, meets uh, sort of regulatory action. And this is uh, near and dear to me. I enjoy the science. And then I also enjoy uh, looking at the science and figuring out, you know, what does that mean? And today I'm going to talk about um, the developing uh, sediment strategy of the San Francisco Bay Water Board. Um, a oh, quick overview, I have uh, a slide on our future sediment need, uh, another slide on additional sediment sources, and then most of my talk is going to focus on uh, what we at the Water Board are, are doing about, ab about this situation. Future sediment need, this is uh, from a uh, regional sediment strategy uh, that San Francisco Estuary Institute is uh, producing. It's almost out, uh, it's being funded by uh, EPA. And this is where demand meets supply, or perhaps I should say lack, lack, of, or lack of supply meets uh, demand. Uh, based on estimates of sediment demand, uh, just for existing bay lands, so that would be uh, polders, which are uh, subsided diked bay lands, uh, tidal wetlands, and tidal mudflats, we need 360 million metric tons just to maintain our existing bay lens uh, right now. When we add restoration on top of that, it becomes 550 million metric tons. Under future uh, sediment supply scenarios uh, from bay tributaries, this would include the delta and then all the other smaller tributaries that come into the bay. Under a drier scenario, we will uh, have 160 million metric tons. So as you can see, if, if under this drier scenario, we're gonna be well short of uh, even existing valence. Uh, under a wetter scenario, the estimated amount is 280 million metric tons. So again, we're still well under uh, existing valence and we really want to restore a lot of our valence um, that's what the Baylands Habitat Goals started in, uh, in 2000, and we want to continue that trend. And as you can see, we're, we're short about 300 million metric tons. Additional sediment sources other than from the tributaries, and this is also from uh, the pending report on the regional sediment strategy from SFEI. Navigational dredging, if we use all the material that's dredged for navigational purposes, it will meet about 60% of our need. Now keep in mind, this is also in some ways robbing Peter to pay Paul because 
this is taking sediment that's already within the system and essentially moving it to tidal flats and, and marshes and, and to the, the shoreline. The next source is excavated upland soils. This is from development and redevelopment sites. Now this is not robbing Peter to pay Paul. This would be all essentially new, new sediments. Um, this can meet about 30% of our need. Again, if, if we maximize use. And then another source is the amount of sediment that's stored behind dams. And this would equal about 20% of our need. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about uh, flood control channels. The report estimates that less than 5% of the need uh, would be met by tidal flood control channels. So what are we doing about this? With this knowledge, we're focusing our attention on um, these four areas, starting with uh, navigational dredging. With the bay navigational dredging, uh, we've identified lots of impediments to beneficial reuse, but I'm gonna focus on two. I'm gonna focus on a, a conservative screening process. This process uses uh, sediment concentrations as well as bioassays, and we've heard from uh, the dredging community that it tends to uh, inhibit or uh, be a disincentive to beneficial reuse. So in September 2019, uh, the Bay Regional Monitoring Program held a beneficial reuse workshop to specifically look at this conservative screening process. And what's come out of that workshop is what's called a floating percentile. Now, we heard uh, earlier from Maggie about um, Puget Sound. Floating percentile is a concept that um, we were taking from Puget Sound, so we're learning from a, a sister program. And what it does is it balances uh, uh, false positives with false negatives by looking at um, previous screening criteria from dredging, uh, chemistry, along with the bioassays. And it balances those false positives with the false negatives. The other thing that we're looking at is cost. The biggest thing about cost is, is essentially time. How far away do they have to ship the materials to get there? And then how long does it take for them to offload these materials? In order to address these issues, uh, we're looking at strategic placement, which would be in particular with the Army Corps. Uh, hopefully they'll be funding this uh, soon. And we're working with the other LTMS agencies, the EPA and Bay Conservation Development Commission, along with the Army Corps, in order to develop this study where we allow uh, them to deposit sediment offshore so that it can be carried onto shore where it's needed in tidal marshes and mudflats. This will help with the cost because rather than having to have an offloader that then um, pumps out a slurry onto your site, they would essentially be able to go with a barge and open um, the cargo doors essentially and allow the sediment to drop, drop out rather quickly. The other thing here that we're considering uh, is hydraulic dredging. We're re I should say we're reconsidering uh, hydraulic dredging. We will be working on a, a California Environmental Quality Act document with the Army Corps for their next uh, permit. Uh, it's in five years, but we have to start working on this right, right now. What we found is that in hydraulic dredging could speed up the process because it creates that slurry from the outset rather than uh, clamshell dredging, which would put the sediment in a barge and it sort of dewaters and then you have to remix it with water before you can put it on a site. So hydraulic dredging, because it would be in a slurry, would, would help with that speed because you wouldn't have to remix it. You could just take it and pump it onto your site. The challenge with this is that hydraulic dredging has some environmental impacts. It sucks up essentially fish. And we have a lot of endangered uh, fish species in San Francisco Bay, so we have to look at the balance of that and see whether it's worth allowing uh, hydraulic dredging in certain parts of the bay where it may have less of an impact on these special status species in order to increase beneficial use. 
The next area that we're working on, remember this is about 30%, is excavated upland soils. And we first started looking at this uh, as part of Bear Island, uh, I want to say about eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I could be dating myself a little bit. Um, and what we found uh, with the upland soils is, again, a conservative screening process um, tends to uh, de-incentivize um, using these materials. And so another, another piece, of, so this, is, this actually benefited from the navigational dredging, so the workshop in 2019. Another suggestion was to look at a, a hazard quotient methodology to assess uh, risk on ecological receptors. And in particular, what it uses is a, a a central tendency of hazard quotients, so a mean of the hazard quotients for non-bioaccumulative compounds. We are starting to look at this primarily for metals that are not bioaccumulative, and we're going to be meeting with the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project and discussing uh, modifying their uh, sampling and, and monitoring program. The other thing that we see coming up is with excavated upland soils is timing availability with need. And this you could really talk about uh, for bay navigational dredging, you could put it into any of these categories. Um, it's often the case where when sediment or soil is available is not when it's needed. And so how do we deal with that? So one thing we've started looking at uh, recently, and I put a question mark because we haven't really figured any, anything out yet, is perhaps we could stockpile for future use. Now, one of the, the concerns with stockpiling is we did have situations at uh, Bear Island where material came in that was not uh, of appropriate quality, uh, and that had to do with the chain of custody and, and managing uh, control of the materials. With stockpiling, we'd have to come up with a, a plan and a program for ensuring that stock, clean stockpile material that was for beneficial reuse was not commingled with other material um, that was not appropriate for beneficial reuse. I, I do think, however, that it, it is very promising and I think we can figure out a way to do it with some help from, from our partners. And the last one I put in here with a question mark is, cost of materials. Right now for restoration sites, they're mostly getting the materials for free because the dirt brokers are able to uh, essentially, if you're really close to where the dirt's generated and the dirt brokers can get, uh, can get rid of it at a closer location, then they don't have to spend as much money trucking it somewhere and they end up making more money. However, I foresee, and I think others foresee in the future, as the as you saw with the the need, the demand and supply um, becomes greater. Uh, I can foresee dirt brokers and others uh, wanting to charge for these materials because they will have a, a, a value, and that value is going to go up as time progresses. Next, I'd like to talk about what's stored behind dams, and here I put the main. Challenge here is other significant environmental effects. Um, we actually had a, a project, Calaveras Dam, that I permitted uh, probably about 12, 13 years ago. And um, it actually had started out 3 million, 3 million cubic yards of excess materials that they had to dispose of. And then in the process of constructing the dam, they found some anomalies and it ended up being 6 million cubic yards of excess materials that they had to dispose of. However, because it's this little two lane windy road, in order to get to where they constructed the dam, and if you think about the number of trucks it would take to ship that material down to the bay, trucks figure 20 cubic yard per truck. 6 million cubic yards, 300,000 truck trips essentially. It just wasn't safe to navigate these little windy roads with that many trucks. So what did they end up doing? They ended up disposing of the material around the dam and actually some of it ended up inside the reservoir itself. So it's trapped 
behind the reservoir and will never um, get into the watershed and down to the bay. Some ideas, uh, some other things that we're working on are actually um, removing dams. There's a Searsville Dam uh, down in uh, Palo Alto with Stanford that we're working on. We also uh, worked on a project that just got implemented, um, the York Dam Removal Project in St. Helena. And for that, the, the, in, the challenge there is that the sediment comes down, but trying to make sure that the sediment comes down and doesn't result in other impacts like flooding and, and other things is um, really challenging. And often it ends up just depositing in flood control channels, which I'm gonna get to next. So some of the thoughts that we're thinking for dams that evacuate their sediment through sluicing, we'd like to see if we can get folks to consider pulse flows. So if you time the flows when you have storm events and you sluice it out with the high storm events, that's when the sediment moves in the system. And that can help move sediment downstream in a more natural uh, process. Another idea is, uh, what about trucking just coarse materials? It's a lot less than the, the finer materials and we could uh, use those to build uh, cobble, uh, cobble beaches, um, which is a, a shoreline re uh, resilience feature, helps to, for wave attenuation. Um, and then here I have incorporate downstream maintenance. If we have dam removals and we're sluicing material down, it's, it, it quite likely will increase um, the amount of maintenance and flood control channels. So we have to take this into consideration as we uh, work through this uh, issues with, with dams. Now flood control channels. In tidal reaches, the advantage is you don't have to really ship it anywhere. It's right there where you need it. And so although it's only about 5%, less than 5% of the material that we need, you don't really have as much of a cost issue because you're not really shipping it very far. So the issue ends up being more of um, how to deal with uh, placing the material. So we're looking at thin lift for direct placement. So if you have an existing marsh, one of our regulatory challenges is if you bury it, that's considered an impact. So we're looking at thin lift for direct placement and I have a slide coming up that I'll, I'll go into more detail on that. The other thing we're looking at is a lot of the flood control channels are actually disconnected uh, from the adjacent wetlands. So we're looking at ways that we can incentivize reconnection um, of the flood control channels to these, uh, to these marshes. And then lastly, I put in here real quick, non-tidal reaches. Again, for some of these areas that are really far away, you think of Livermore Valley, that's a long truck trip, but Coarse materials are particularly important for building up beaches along in, in, at the fronts of marshes in order to attenuate wave energy in order to, to ensure that they don't erode back. So one idea might be to just truck the coarse materials and the finer materials we'll, we'll have to deal with later. And now I'm gonna go into some specific slides uh, to talk about some of the flood control channel work that we're doing. Here's the thin lift placement idea that we're working on. And the way we get around our sort of policy issue of, of filling um, wetlands is that we take a long-term term view of things. As you can see here, we have a healthy marsh over to the left. And then to the right, as you get sea level rise, you start getting degradation uh, along the edge of the, the marsh uh, caused by wind and wave erosion. And one thing that we're looking at is potentially using thin layer placement. So you place it directly on the marsh, but you place it in a thin lift so that the vegetation can grow up through it. And that's how we get around um, the impact. We look at the long-term benefit for maintaining the marsh in order to allow for this short-term impact. And the long-term benefit is right here on marsh regeneration as this material allows the marsh to keep up with sea level rise. So I'll give about a minute if you can sort of do that. Okay. Cool, thank you. Yep, the other thing we're looking at is uh, for restoration projects like the Galenus uh, Creek and McGinnis Marsh, uh, dredging and McGinnis Marsh restoration, 
project. McGinnis Marsh is uh, a diked bay lens. It has uh, a treatment plant right here, and they're looking at building a, a horizontal levee. They need a million cubic yards, and they plan on reconnecting Miller Creek, which is right here. You see it takes this, uh, it's like even less than a 90 degree angle, which is unnatural. They can, by reconnecting Miller Creek, you can get the sediment from Miller Creek to, um, to bring up the elevations in the, the marsh. The other thing they're looking at is bringing in 100,000 cubic yards of uh, dredge material from the Galenus Dredge Project which I'm gonna talk about right now. Here's where the McGinnis Marsh Restoration Project is. Here's the dredge, dredging project. As you can see, super close, super easy, and that will help to start um, providing material for the horizontal levy. With that, I just, uh, thanks for, for your time. And I turn it back over to John. Great, thank you very much. So we're gonna be having both Maggie Pat and Xavier joining our uh, present we're joining the Q&A and I think what's really important in all the presentations that we heard from today is we want to base our decisions on science, uh, real science, economics, as well as looking at creative approaches with a long-term view of how we're going to be able to um, uh, resolve some of the problems and issues we're facing, whether it be in Washington State, Virginia, or California. and. With that, um, I'd like to see, I'm gonna be fed some questions here and uh, see what we have. So we have a first question, it's for Maggie and Maggie can lead off and if somebody wants to add into it, that's great. How's your program funded? Is it by the state, by dischargers and what is the annual budget? Yeah, um, I did uh, type a response back to that but we are funded by the state legislature. Um, it's actually a tax that comes from um, tax on petroleum products in part. And our annual budget for this program is about $280,000. Um, it was a lot higher when we used to do more of the toxicity testing. Um, but as we scaled back, uh, the, the costs were down. And now we, we've moved to a lot of um, biogeochemical measures, which are a whole lot cheaper than the chemistry. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Pat, I have a question. Um, how much should the Mars Edge have you protected by reefs, oysters, and scallops historically? And is there an acre goal of oyster reef restoration that you're, that's been established by the state? So, uh, no, the state has not been involved, although, um, you know, there have been uh, attempts to modify some of the regulations to allow, say, for these living shoreline or to incentivize people to take a kind of a living shoreline approach as opposed to something else they might try to do with their um, shoreline property. But um, we, so the, the constructed oyster reefs have been used, I mean, it's really a, a pilot, I guess, at this point. We've got probably maybe six different sites where we've put them in, but there's a tremendous amount of marsh edge in our system. So one of the purposes of the, um, of the example that I showed you was actually even trying to figure out what's the best construction design so that we get the most effective um, habitat, you know, hard substrate for oysters and the most uh, benefit to the adjacent marsh. But it's still, um, work that's ongoing in order to determine what's best. And, and there's never really any plan to do it everywhere. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Xavier, can you explain uh, why there would be an increased sediment supply under a wetter scenario? Well, the, I think the answer to that is probably to wait for the report to come out. Um, okay. The, the, but under a wetter scenario, generally speaking, um, you would get, uh, more storm events and more storm events would move more sediment. That's just the, a general, um, a general statement. Okay. But, and um, this the, the exact oh. details though would be in the report. Great thing. When is the report going to be coming out? Um, it should be coming out uh, potentially this month or next month. Uh, okay. We just provided comments uh, a couple weeks ago. And I have a question for the three of you. Uh, 
each of you have a, a program that you're funding where entering a recession, it appears, or it depends who you listen to. Uh, but all the local governments are being impacted and uh, businesses are being impacted. So what do you see from a funding standpoint, an outlook for the funding for each of your respective programs? Why don't we start with Maggie, then Pat, then Javier? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I know that our state budget is not great this year and the projections for the next biennium also are not very good. Um, this year, 2020, we actually were not able to go out sampling at all. So we had some savings there. Um, and uh, as of what I've heard recently, we are um, supposedly going to be allowed to go sampling in uh, 2021, um, given that we can get all the proper protocols in place for social distancing and such on the boat. So I think we are gonna be able to sample in 2021, but I would say the jury's out um, even on that too. I really have a big question mark in my mind, just given the state of the state budget. Thank you, Pat. So um, our program is not funded by the state. Um, our, it, we have our funding from the National Science Foundation and then we've also leveraged that to get funding from um, other agencies and, and groups. We're, I guess, lucky that the timing is such that we're sort of two years into a six-year funding cycle. Um, so maybe by the time um, our current funding period is over, um, the coronavirus will be over too and things will be more back to normal. Uh, but we did also uh, experience some uh, pretty dramatic disruptions this past summer. There was very little research that was able to be done. So there's going to be a scramble this year and next summer to catch up. Thank you. So far, it hasn't affected our program all that much, um, mostly because we're working on policies and um, there have been some budget cuts, uh, some staff allocations, but um, those are being um, accommodated by the state board. So it hasn't af affected uh, my region all that much so far. Uh, collecting data may uh, become a little more difficult if, if we can't um, get funding for the monitoring, but I'm hoping that we're able to pull through. Great. And so I might ask you a question when you talked about way adding the uh, sediment into the waterways and the waves moving sediment around for wetland creation, which would increase obviously turb turbidity and impacts. Do you foresee uh, some of the wildlife stakeholders uh, challenging these regulations or uh, that approach to disbursement of uh, dredge material for wetland restoration, shoreline protection? I do foresee them challenging it, yeah. Um, I think we need to look at the science uh, and look also at um, disturbance ecology. And when you look at um, disturbances in the Bay Area. You also look at uh, turbid natural turbidity. Um, there may be a way to time it. Also, uh, there may be sort of a frequency of disturbance that is can be at a tolerable level. Um, these are all questions that we need to, to study and collect information on. And a lot of that's tied into whether the Army Corps can get funding for that monitoring of strategic placement. Um, so that we're able to collect the information uh, with, along with um, some of the Fish and Wildlife Agencies and get buy-in as we move along. Thank you. A question for Maggie. Are there good examples in the long-term trends in sediment pollutant concentrations in Puget Sound? Good examples of long-term trends. Um, yes, I would say that we have uh, seen we generally do detect metals in our sediments and we detect PAHs. Um, and um, a number of years back, uh, when we did a, a big data summary, 
um, we were seeing the levels of metals actually going down in our sediments and pH is going up. And, um, you know, I don't know if that was attributable to um, increasing um, pollutants going into the air um, or what, we, we don't have a way to actually connect with what the different sources are. Um, and more recently, um, in a recent um, sort of big picture summary we've done, we, uh, and that this is about a 10 year uh, interval later, um, we actually have uh, seen, I think it was the opposite, that um, there are some metals that have been on the increase and some of the pH levels have gone down. So we have seen different trends over time um, and they're summarized in some of our reports. Great, thank you. Um, Pat, a question for you. Uh, clearly the work you're doing has benefits all around in the fishing industry and environmentally. Do you have any opponents to what you're doing? And if so, <laughs> why? Well, um, the, I would say one issue is the seagrass restoration work has the potential to um, create seagrass meadows in areas that are otherwise would be, say, clam, clam bed areas or um, other aquaculture areas. So there's a little bit of a conflict. Um, you know, there are some regulations, there are some set asides for the seagrass and there are least sites for the aquaculture, but um, that's the main thing. I mean, of course, there are always people who are unhappy about, um, you know, limitations to what they can do in ter terms of stabilizing their shoreline, but that's handled by someone else. Um, you know, it's more regulatory, but on the science side, it really has more to do with conflicting use of the bay bottoms. Great, thank you. This question is for Xavier. It's going back to the, thin, to the question of thin layer sediment and placement. It seems like it would be a, a delicate operation. Is it a me mechanic, me mechanical in, or is it performed by hand and has a cost range been established per meter of, for sediment uh, to do this kind of work? Uh, cost range has not been uh, established to my knowledge just yet. Uh, from flood control channels, uh, it's done mechanically through excavators. Um, so they, they actually place it and then they splay it out um, with, with dirt movers. And, but in Louisiana, what, what they actually do is they, when they're dredging, they, they literally, they do hydraulic dredging and then they just spray it right on the marsh surface. It's just like a fire hose. And, uh, you know, we'd be interested in looking at that. That's a bit challenging in California because we have uh, fully protected species in our marshes. And those are the sorts of trade-offs and challenges that we're, we're investigating right now. Thank you. I've seen that done in Holland and it was quite impressive how they uh, dispersed the sediment uh, out of a fire hose. Um, if there, for each of you, if there's one thing you could do in the next two years with your program, for success, what would you want to have happen and what would you do? Uh, Maggie, you can start with you. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I actually like the path that we're moving forward with. Our program has focused on toxicity and chemicals for since its inception, basically, but um, I didn't get a chance to fully explain that. Um, we are now kind of moving in a direction where we're, we're keeping a handle on that, especially in the urban bays, but we're also looking at parameters that are more related to nutrient loading, carbon and nutrient loading, and climate change. Um, and so I really think that I want to, you know, for the, the first few years in a long-term program, when you are looking at new parameters, you don't, it takes a while to get a sense of what they're doing and what the trends will be over time. So in the next few years, I'm really hoping that we, those new parameters um, 
will give us a sense of um, how the nutrients, um, nutrient loading in the sound and different climate change pressures um, are uh, affecting the sediments. Um, and that will start to pull together a picture that is um, a little bit broader than what we were just looking for with toxics, which we really didn't see um, a lot of correlative evidence of toxic signals on the benthos. So we're just looking forward to um, really getting a handle on our new data. Great, thank you. Pat? Well, there are many researchers that work in this system, so I, I can't speak for everyone, but um, I'd say two things um, that are related. Um, we're doing a lot of work trying to integrate data and models in order to get sort of a, a better handle on the whole system and observations tend to be sort of more localized. The model gives us a chance, chance to scale up. But one of the things that we really need for that is um, more kind of remote sense typed information that we can use to, um, to characterize, say, the, the cover, vegetation cover, and things like that. And one thing that's proved very useful was in 2015, um, in a, through a cooperation with the state and the USGS, there was high resolution LIDAR flown on the system. We'd love to have a repeat LIDAR at least by say 2025 to be able to look at change. That would be a great way to quantify change in the system, which is otherwise hard just because it's so, so large. Thank you, uh, Xavier. Uh, well, I think within two years, if we can get adopted a basin plan amendment, which would change our policies um, to incentivize uh, beneficial reuse for living shoreline projects, I would be ecstatic. And what do we need to do to have that happen? Um, well, right now we, we have the science, uh, a lot of the science in place. And so what we're going through the process right now of is looking at what the actual language is in the basin plan that we need to revise. And then we're gonna start doing uh, outreach through workshops and go through the Cal California Environmental Quality Act process uh, where we craft the language and work with stakeholders and receive input and then uh, move on to preparing a staff report, which takes all the science that just, that just essentially justifies the policy changes and then putting that out for adoption um, by our board. Great, thank you. I'd like to thank Maggie, Pat, and Xavier and the staff at SFEI for uh, helping put this uh, panel on. Um, in closing, we don't know what's gonna be happening with uh, on November 3rd, how that may change EPA direction on a national level or potentially whether more funding may or may not be coming uh, due to changes in the Senate and the House as well as the presidential side. But we're also gonna have the local demands that are gonna be coming down on all of us in our respective areas and needing to work on that. Um, we all have different issues, but at the same time, we're all working at it from a scientific standpoint. And we have to look at things in a new light, I believe. We have to be able to uh, be creative and it's the Three panelists talked about being creative today in their different regions. And from that, we have something we can learn from in each of respective areas. And the bottom line is sediment, not many years ago, was not viewed as having economic value. There's tremendous economic value in sediment and how it can be used. And with climate change and sea level rise, sediment is going to play a critical role and protecting our assets going into the future and our children's ability to uh, be able to uh, stay hopefully along the coastal zones where they may enjoy living now and working. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Melissa. And again, I'd like to thank the panelists or, and for your time today and staff at SFEI for making this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John, and thank you, Javier, Maggie, and Pat for another great session this morning. Um, so we are 
John, you ran a tight ship and we are right on time. Um, so we are, we are going to take a, a break now. Uh, we'll be back here at one uh, for the next two sessions um, on uh, contaminants of emerging concerns and um, urban stormwater runoff. So we will see you back here in an hour. Thank you, everyone.